Uh, today we're going to be talking about some of the mistakes that beginner hunters make when they first get out into the field. So specifically talking about night hunting and hog hunting and uh, maybe some predator hunting, but uh, we have a list of things we've come up with that are mistakes that we've made that we've observed people make and uh, things that you generally want to avoid if you want to be effective hunting at night. Number one for me is definitely not playing the wind properly. I think that's my number like the number one overall mistake that we do when we first start getting into hog hunting. What can you do to make sure you don't get in a bad wind situation? I mean, first pay attention to, you know, obviously which way the wind's blowing. You want the wind in your face at all, all times. times. And if you can't get the wind in your face, then just study the terrain. Look at your GPS map and work your way around the animals and try to get that, that advantage of the wind. Sometimes you don't really have a choice. Like the hogs are in a corner and you got woods on one side or you got some sort of physical barrier that's preventing you from doing it. But if you have a way to go around and take some more time, it may not be the most direct way, but if you can stalk with the wind in your face or at least a crosswind, uh, you're going to be much more successful. Sometimes if we don't have the wind in our favor, I mean, you better move fast. You better just get down there, set up and get ready to shoot. Cause as soon as those hogs catch your scent, they're gone, they're gone. You see their nose come up in the air. And that's it. They'll, better that be lock, ready. they'll lock up and get prepared to take, take a long shot if you need to, but it's just one of those things. One thing that was interesting when we went up to South Dakota is that um, the O'Neill boys, they set up specific locations that they only go to when the wind is right. Not everybody has that luxury, but you can kind of plan your hunt around what the wind is doing. So, you know, certain properties, you're only going to have one entrance point. And if the wind is bad, you may just need to hunt a different property that night. If you have the luxury of having multiple properties to go to or multiple spots, that's helpful. Wind is everything. You can blow an entire hunt. Bad wind. What's next? Clothing for sure. Swishy pants. Please don't show up with windbreakers or any type of rain suit. Swishy that's the only way I can explain. Swishy pants. Do not show up with swishy pants. I've gone to wool, so it's made yeah, a big difference. Yeah, wool's awesome. Jeans are okay. I wear jeans all the time and a hoodie. You don't want loud fabric. I'm guilty of it. Had those snowboard pants. And, you know, <laughs> you'll blow the hunt right there. Yeah. And a lot of it has to do because we, we like to get close. Not everybody is trying to get uh, 15, 20, 30 yards away from the animal. Some people are comfortable with 100, 150 yard shots. You can get away with that clothing. But I know for a fact, uh, Rich was probably the main one that wanted me to start getting closer to animals. And that has a lot to do with footage and follow-up shots. Mm -hmm. That's huge. So it, you got to pay attention to your clothing and the wind if you want to be able to pull off those type, of, those type of stalks. Let's talk about that because that was one of the things I had on my list is one of the mistakes that I see people make is not getting close enough to the animals. You all want to elaborate on oh, yeah. why you want to get closer? Well, follow-up shots, number one. I mean, if you're if you're starting at 100 yards, you're going to be taking 150, 200-yard shots at that point. You get to 50 yards, now you're, you know, 60, mm -hmm. 75, all the way out to 100. They're covering ground really fast. Those pigs get out there really quickly. So the closer that you can get, the better chance you have of getting more on the ground. So if you start out at like 20 yards, you're going to have a lot better luck than if you start out shooting from 100. I know some people like to shoot from far away. It's maybe an ego thing, but if you want to be effective, you want to get as close as possible without getting busted. And the likelihood of them just dropping on the first round. I mean, you're getting you're getting your max, you know, energy for the most part if you're shooting at 50 yards versus 150. I mean, chances are that bullet's going to do its job. Yeah. Obviously with shot placement. And we're not using FMJs. I want to talk about it. Oh, we're going to talk about it. <laughs> All right, let's talk about ammo. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Let's 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 hear your thoughts on using FMJs. I, I think it's I'm ridiculous. Using, well, if I'm if I'm now this is just pig hunting specifically, not cow hunting, not varmint hunting. I'm just talking about pig hunting. That's it. If I'm using a five five six two two three, I swear by using the M eight five five. Okay, I always get good results. They tumble. It does what it does. The neck on that ammo. When you shoot, it's about a six inch neck before it starts tumbling, and that's in my opinion is perfect. So bone anything else it's just so it you're saying you get better results with fmjs in 223 than you do with like a hollow point yeah with soft points penetration for me is key on pigs especially with a, a smaller caliber like a 223 please people comment on this because this is ridiculous 
Hollow points, hollow points, soft points. Uh, you want to get to the Bibles. I mean, man, some of them open up way too early and not get the penetration. Let the bullet do what it does. I've had too many times where I've shot, you know, pigs with obviously starting out. I can't tell you how many guys will go out there with VMAX bullets. It's a varmint bullet. That's one of the mistakes I made pig hunting. I had a 300 blackout and I used 110 grain VMAX. It's what I had. It's not awful round for pick hunting. It is true to an extent. Like you can have a round that does open up too quickly. I haven't had good luck with FMJs, but I haven't hunted with two, two, three. I think it probably has to do with the uh, velocity of the round. Some of those faster rounds probably open up quicker. Who knows? It's, it's cheap. And that's the only advantage an FMJ has over everything else is cost. It's cheap. And I think that's the argument that you're trying to put out there. That's it. It will not outperform especially a copper projectile you're crazy no. copper hollow point bullet it's just i it, get i get what you're saying but there's no way it depends how many hogs you want to shoot if you're going to go out there you know and you're shooting five something like that in one night use copper but if you're using if you're seeing sounders left and right and everything else that stuff adds up big time oh yeah it, it adds it adds up slinging copper out there it, it, it adds up, but I want to be effective in the field. I will say this, and we haven't talked about shot placement yet. Now, with FMJs and good shot placement, hell yeah, it's going to put animals down. That's just not my go-to. You could drop a hog with any type of ammo, yep. any caliber, on your first shot if you have good shot yep. placement. 100%. But that's not the case always with hogs. If you're lucky, you're going to have one good stationary shot and then the rest is on the run and that's just a different art when you're shooting those pigs on the run that's a whole different thing it's yeah. a volume game it at that is. point but why wouldn't you just use like a bigger round like 762 by 39 rather than using 223 because his doesn't run <laughs> dude <laughs> yeah i've had some bad luck with some uh ar-10s in the past but you know this one I've got now hasn't had any issues. Knock on wood. Okay. Uh, that brings back some nightmares. So Todd's got a $1,200, 300 Win Mag AR on the way. No, I don't. Shot you. No, I don't. Oh, I saw the yeah. price. I saw the price. I'm like, here we go. <laughs> that was only, a good price. I could only imagine the problems no. when that thing suppressed. Let's talk about shot placement. Um, it's fairly basic. It's only really people who are coming from like deer hunting that don't know the shot placement on hogs. So they'll shoot like behind the shoulder, which is going to be gut shot, gut shot and not I good. Love but love that shot. Head shots and neck shots on a hog. That's the way to go behind the ear on the neck. You have the most margin for error. So 100%. if you're too far forward or if you're too far back, I agree. you're most likely still going to get a kill straight on the shoulder will work fine, but aim for the neck. Mm -hmm. I like that. I like that shoulder, shoulder, front shoulder, all the way up to the head. Head on, do not go for the headshot head on. I've had too many bad experiences, but that's just my personal opinion. But I like chest, if they're head on, with their broadside shoulder all the way to the head. Just north of the shoulder for me. I mean, get what you can get. And wait for a broadside. If oh, you have a hog yeah. that's that's quartering away or something like that, or quartering towards you, that's when that's when I get the most uh, that run is going to be when it's not broadside. Mm -hmm. If you have the opportunity, wait for a good broadside, and they're going to go down instantly. It, it doesn't always go like that, unfortunately. You know, you got, let's just say, five or six pigs, and you're by yourself. That first shot's always going to be the best one, and then you got runners, and unfortunately, you know, there's going to be some gut shots here and there, but we still do our best to double tap them and give them that good, clean kill. Another thing I wanted to talk about is something I see, like, fairly often, is people i don't know if it's an ego thing or what but people who want to shoot freehand they feel like i'm too good for a tripod or or a shooting sticks or a rest and they come out and hit nothing i was that guy i enjoy doing it for sometimes now if it's a single pig out there for sure go out there if you're confident and if you can do it do it i mean but if you get into a, a group of 30 i'm not going out there freehanded yeah. it's just you're not going to hear that thump. I just hate to tell you. When I first got into this, I was free-handed almost all. I, I literally had this conversation with Tyler last night, and I, I seen an old picture that I had back in, like, 2013. It was a low-light photo of me laying down prone in the grass. If the grass was low enough, I used to go prone. If the grass was wet and tall, I would get in the kneeling position. If the ground was too wet for me to get in the kneeling position, I, sh I shot free-handed. And if it was too hard of a shot freehand, I tried to find a fence post or a tree. I didn't have tripods or shooting sticks. 
And now that we have tripods, oh my God, the kill rate, the shot placement, the accuracy, it has completely changed the game. And I remember people saying that, be a man, shoot free-handed, you know? <laughs> You'll never see me go back free-handed. For me anyway, um, man, really going from aluminum legs to carbon fiber has changed it for me. Yeah. I know we're kind of jumping a little bit on that, but you can have the best head basically on that aluminum tripod on the legs. You're still shaking. Yeah. There's too much give. I mean, but when, whenever I went with the carbon fiber legs, nothing moves. Nothing. nothing. So Solid. Get a quality tripod, get a quality head. There's plenty of options out right now. I would say the gold standard is like really right stuff, but... There's tons of other brands that are just as good. You have the two vets, you have the fat boy tripods, the other regular Chinese brands, the Leo photos that are basically ripoffs of the yeah. really right stuff and some other things. I have some Gitzo tripods, which are like high quality uh, photography tripods. And those things are super solid. You can get them on eBay super cheap too. That's a good place to get them because photographers are getting rid of their good gear and it's in like way better shape than mm -hmm. your stuff is ever going to be because yeah. we trash our stuff. Yeah, within two weeks they're mm -hmm. tore up. It's already broke one head. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're rough on them. But. Yeah, Tyler ran mine over. <laughs> stuff but happens, but yeah. Get a good tripod though. You're spending, we'll just say you're spending a minimum 2,500, three grand on a thermal scope. More than likely you got a thousand dollar rig. You're spending money and just spend a little bit of money on a good tripod. And I'm telling you, it's going to change the game. One thing that happens when we go out with people who don't hunt a lot, like I'll take some people hunting sometimes and they don't have much experience. And uh, so we'll go line up on a group of pigs. Everyone will shoot. And then once they're done shooting, we'll look, there's only one pig on the ground and you got four shooters. And then everyone starts talking to each other and they find out everyone shot the same pig. They all shot the biggest pig. So yeah. I always tell people when I take them out hunting, I say, if you're on the right hand side, shoot the pig on the right. If you're on the left, shoot the pig on the left. And I intentionally try to pick one that I don't think anyone's going to shoot mm -hmm. like a small one or whatever. It happened last night. We were up on a group of pigs. They're all 50 pounders, but I knew everybody was going to go for the clear shots in the middle. And I just went for the far right one that was in the brush. You can barely see them. I dropped them. We all dropped our pigs, but I knew that if I was shooting in the middle, that we were going to double up on the same pig. Everybody wants to go for the biggest pig. Everybody. Everybody. I'm guilty of it. Yeah. Sometimes if it's a really big pig and I'm like with this person and they always seem to have a gun jam or they forgot to check if their mag was empty. I'm just going to shoot this big one to make sure we get it down. Yeah. So sometimes I do that. But if you want to get numbers, communicate, coordinate. Oh, yes. If it's a slow night, everybody's going to go for that big pig. Yeah. But once you kind of coordinate with whoever it is that you're hunting with, for sure. Left, right, center, yeah. all that. If you have four guys and everybody drops their first pig, getting four on the ground, that's nice. And then anything else you get is a bonus. Yep. So you can really start putting up numbers if everybody does their job on the easiest shot, which is the first shot. And hunting with the same people. I, I, I usually hunt with the same people all the time. And now it's just, we naturally know what to do. And we had those those two by that lake that one time we both dropped. Instant. We didn't even have to say nothing. You yeah. knew I was on the right and you was on the left. It helps if people know the protocol. So if I take people hunting, that first stalk, you kind of just have to get it out of the way. It's so clunky and inefficient. Nobody knows exactly what's going on. Everybody's kind of looking around and waiting to see, you know, what everybody else is doing. And once you kind of get everybody on the same page and coordinated, you move so much quicker. Just communicating stuff beforehand, like, okay, what are you going to, are we going to count it down? Are we going to count? Are we going to shoot on three? Are we going to shoot on two and a half? <laughs> you got to communicate that stuff because otherwise, once you get up there, somebody's going to mess it up for you. Yeah. That countdown. That one gets everybody because we all do. I know for a fact I, between me and Rich, our countdowns are different and I'm pretty positive ours is. Yeah. Too. So some people like one, two, three. Some people like three, two, one. I like three, two, boom. Yeah. But then you always hunt with that guy. If you even have, you know, that solid countdown going, there's yeah. always that one person that yeah. shave off that one yep. second. Yep. I was guilty of that in the past. Now, if I'm not a hundred percent positive on the countdown, I just wait for everybody else to shoot. Yeah. And then I'll shoot right after them. As long as you're planning to shoot once everybody else shoots, it's fine. But if you get surprised by somebody touching one off, then you're probably going to miss. Tyler. Yeah. 
one of the mistakes that I would make, especially when I get on a big group of pigs, we do the countdown and I shoot and I'm so ready to pin to the next hog that I'm going to shoot that I end up pulling my shot on the first one and don't drop it. So it helps to just sit on it, sit on that first shot, yeah. kind of follow it through, see it connect and then move on to the next thing. Relax, relax. Take your time on the first one and then everything else will come. I'd rather concentrate on that first one. That way I know for a fact that, hey, I got footage of this first one going down and then everything after that, like he said earlier, it's a bonus. It's when you miss and then next thing you know, you just continue to miss. Yeah, it shakes your confidence. When you miss that first one and you, you assume that you're going to just drop it and it doesn't drop, it throws everything off. Yeah, everybody's done it and then there goes your confidence. Mm -hmm. You're like, I, I just missed a standing pig. Now I'm going to start leading hogs. You're crazy. T-Mac will be in the background. I'm done. I'm done happens all the time this is probably something i've gained from personal experience just messing up myself is not understanding the lighting conditions so there's mm -hmm. kind of the general lighting conditions if you haven't hunted at night you assume that it's nighttime so animals can't see you that's not true they can see you especially if if you've got a full moon or close to it you need to be aware of your visible signature people say hogs can't see they can see they can see your silhouette and your outline. You still have to use techniques like walking along a tree line rather than just walking straight out in the middle of a field if you can avoid it. Or if you have trees or hay bales or something, you can stalk in behind. Or if you have a big group of guys, try to get them to get in a single file line as much as possible so you don't have a giant wide signature of like four people walking side by side spread out so they will see you. Yeah, there's nothing like having a, a full moon night where the moon is behind you, casting a shadow in the open you know, of a pasture and you're downwind. Unfortunately, things happen that way, but you're going to be taking a long shot. In that situation, we get in the truck and we're running them down. Yeah, your chances of sneaking up on a large group of hogs straight out in the open with a lot of moonlight, one of them is going to see you. Mm -hmm. That's why I don't like, I don't even like shooting really, really big groups of pigs. It's always disappointing because you almost always get busted. There's always some pig that's in between you and the rest of the pigs yeah. or some pig that's just paying attention and just staring at you the entire time. There's always one. That light grunt, it's over. That's all it takes. And they're gone. Last night we had a coyote that seen us. We had good cover too. It was a full moon, had a tree line behind us. Lip squeaked him. He locked up at 175 yards. And he was just staring right at us. And I was like, that joker's looking right at us. Sent it died but we just knew he wasn't going to come in any closer it's funny when you get busted all the scenarios you run through your head to try to figure out what it is the one that sticks out in my mind is when we we're hunting at the lease with angelo and we kept getting busted we could not figure out what it was and then we looked at his watch and he oh, had one of those that. indiglo watches that yes. was pretty like a beacon yeah. yes that was a couple of years ago we also had somebody else that had a strobe on their helmet i was like hey, you gotta take that off man nobody's gonna shoot you in the back of the head <laughs> like we see you. Take it off. Was it IR strobe or an actual visible light strobe? Now that you say it, I think it was an IR because I remember running night vision at that time. It was IR. But it was still, it was. It'd be it distracting. Was, yeah, it was screwing yeah. me up. Yeah. Just hunting in the buggy with an IR strobe when you're running night vision. Oh that sounds God. awesome. It was horrible. Yeah. But lighting is everything. Yeah. yeah, one thing we we're, uh, were talking about earlier is specifically getting backlit or silhouetted. That's one time you get busted and it's like, it can be a really, really dark night. So you think that you're fine and you get busted and you're like, what happened? And then you look back to where you were stalking from and you notice there's a spotlight or like a security light or something in the background and you stick out like a sore thumb. Mm -hmm. Or if you're up on, on a hilltop or something like that and walking or walking along a ridge, it's really easy to see your outline. So sometimes you have to crouch down or you have to get lower on a hill and kind of walk across the grade in order not to get backlit. They know the difference. They know when there's a human standing there. Some other stuff that I see pretty often, easily avoidable, stuff like not charging your batteries. Every time. You get out there, you don't turn on your scope, you go and stalk 300 yards, you set up to shoot, and your battery's dead. Always. I always have spare batteries in the truck or in the buggy. It's always spare batteries. But before I even start, I turn that scope on. I look at my battery life, make sure audio's on. I check everything, and then I put it in standby mode. I go on my stalk. Always. Because it's happened to me so many times. 
it's the worst. It's the worst experience ever when you get up there in front of animals, especially by yourself. And it's like, what, what do you do? It, it, it happened to me last week. Or not chambering your rifle. Ooh. You get out there and you haven't chambered your rifle, then you got to do that quiet chamber. And it never works. It never, it never works. works. You think that you're doing it so quietly. And it's just a payoff, no big deal. And then you pull the trigger and you just hear a click because it didn't go into battery. Or you chamber it and they just run. Yeah. yeah, it's brutal. A lot of people that get into this for the first time, and I'm not bashing deer hunters. I'm just using it as an example. A lot of people do not like traveling around in a buggy or stalking with a loaded rifle mm -hmm. and I, I i get it but in our world at nighttime and stalking and getting really close to animals that rifle better be loaded before we even get out of the truck it needs to be loaded and ready to go just make sure your safety's on and i'm always trying not to curse here but i'm always fondling the safety to make sure my safety is on I think all of us do it too. We're always checking where the safety is. Yeah, at always, time. always check. Just following the rules of gun safety, knowing where your muzzle is pointing at all times. Mm -hmm. It's pretty popular these days for people to just clip in their rifle into a tripod and then stalk in with it connected. But I've been in some scenarios where I went back and reviewed the footage and the dude who we're hunting with has all this recorded footage of his crosshairs all over everybody oh, when they're stalking. Stuff like that, just gun safety that's stuff. Scary. You got to follow those gun safety rules, especially at night when you don't have as much situational awareness. You don't know where everybody is all the time. It's really important to just stick to the basics yeah. in terms of gun safety. Know who you're hunting with. I can't express that enough. There's been, obviously, we read so many stories out there, and, and, and it's happened to me, and I know it's happened to you guys as well. I've had too many just WTF moments where I didn't even know that could even happen. I had a guy, I don't hunt with him anymore, I'll put it that way. We were stalking this group, and I brought enough gear for three of us. I'm in the center, a buddy of mine has a thermal, he's good to go, suppressed. Buddy on my right, all I had left for him was a thermal monocular. He brought his rifle with him, but he just wanted to be part of the hunt, I guess. Explained to everybody, I'm center, you're left. Just go ahead and watch. There's nothing more I can do for you right now. I go three, two, one. All of a sudden, three guns are going. I've never even heard anything, how this can even shake out. My man is holding the thermal monocular right here, and he's shooting with one hand with his AR. Oh, man. That's, we don't hunt anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's that's bad. It was like Tropic Thunder with Ben Stiller out there. Yeah, that's bad. It always seems to be the people who tout their background as a reason why they're safe with guns. Or the, yeah. the people who are, quote, experts seem to be the ones doing the very sketchy stuff. So I usually never take anybody at their word. I'm always vigilant making sure I know where everybody is, where they're pointing their muzzles. And like if I have to take somebody out, Oftentimes, like I'm just carrying my rifle and their rifle, yeah. yeah. And I'll give it to, I'll set it up, and they can get on the rifle as soon as we get out there. Newbies, I don't. Sometimes I don't even have a rifle on me. If I do, I'm carrying a rifle that they're using, and I'll help them get set up. I'm literally babysitting them in the field until I get that trust built up with them. But you can't trust everybody out there. Mm -mm. And you never know how excited somebody's gonna get once those pigs start running too. And there's been incidents where people have been shot 100%. and or killed every year because of that every year once the pigs start running and everyone's swinging in different directions it gets sketchy yeah. so just be careful out there know who you're hunting with make sure you trust them and even then be vigilant yeah pay attention pay attention something along the lines of not charging your batteries another one's not checking your zero that's a good one moving scopes around don't get me wrong these mounts are great some of them are, we got some of them that have ADM mounts on them and zero delta and all kinds of different mounts are great mounts, but bouncing from rifle to rifle, it is always good to just double check your zero. Right? It's really easy to assume that you're on the correct rifle profile. Like if you sight in your scope on one rifle and you switch it to another one. And so you have them both saved, you got to check just to make double sure that you have it on the right rifle mm -hmm. profile, the right distance, the right ammo. And you need to just check your scope. A lot of the times when somebody is missing, they find out like the screws are completely loose on their mount. So lock tight all your stuff and then check it periodically. Make sure your scope's not loose. Always check. I might be a little bit different, but I was just kind of run mine with the coordinates. I never do the profile saves. It just makes me know that I've got to put the coordinates each time. So I'll just get, you know, a little piece of tape, put on the rifle. 
do it in the notes section of the iPhone, but I don't know if I'm doing that way oddly. It sounds like a pain, yeah. but I do uh, write down all the coordinates in my notes on my phone so I can check it. Like, okay, this should be the right profile, but if I have the coordinates down, I can look and see that it's actually the right coordinates. I go off of the profiles. So usually now we have a lot more profiles like the rh50r has a lot more profiles but usually it's just a b and c a will be a, my 223 bolt b would be my 65 and then c will be 308 you know like i i just know but i still double check that zero every yep. time what zero do you guys actually use when you're zeroing your rifle in for pig hunting i do 50 yards to zero zero and then i confirm at 100 yards i'm always trying to be dead on at 100 yards the faster cartridges like the 22250, Six Creed, um, just the faster cartridges, I try to be about a half inch high at 100. I'm always at 50. Yeah, I slide in at 50. Although on some of these uh, newer scopes with the ballistic calculators, I've slided in at different distances. Like that hybrid 50, I slided in at 50, 100, 200, 300, and 400. I checked it on all of them. Which is cool to do if you want to take some longer shots. Yeah. And it's interesting, though, because you can really verify whether you got that 50 yard zero right once you start shooting it out a little bit longer. Yeah. 50 can be tricky. So, like, for example, we'll go to the slow stuff like a 308. You don't want to be dead on at 50 yards with a 308. Yeah. You're going to want to be a little low at 50. So that's why I confirm at 100 yards. The thing I think that messes people up a lot is that they'll sight in real short, like 25 yards. They'll just assume it's 50 or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then once they start taking those shots that are right around 100 yards, they end up being like three or four inches high, especially yeah. if you have a, a high sitting thermal, mm -hmm. like the RS-75, that big height over bore is gonna make a big difference. And if you sight in at like 25, you're gonna be real the, the high. hybrid 50, you're gonna be really high. Yeah. Just double check, and it doesn't hurt to double check. I know for a fact that not all the animals we shoot at are gonna come in within 100 yards. One thing I get a lot, this is something with new hunters, is they don't have a sense of urgency. Like when we see hogs, they think they got all the time in the world, like those hogs are just gonna be out there all night. Sometimes they are, but a lot of times, if you take too long, those hogs are gone. They're on the move, they're heading towards the woods. There's nothing worse than like seeing a solo boar and getting ready to put on a stalk and he's just moving at a steady clip and you end up stalking 700 yards because you don't make up any ground on him. Can't keep up. Mm -mm. And definitely get used to your equipment. There's a lot of times, you know, new shooters, they're fumbling with a the tripod. They're doing everything else. Their thermal scope's not even on. You know, you start walking out there and things like that. You have your shot, and now you don't have your shot because you're waiting on somebody else who's... Get familiar with your scope, the menus, and everything like that. A lot of people are like, oh, I bought this new rifle for this hunt, and they're not familiar with the rifle. They haven't sighted it in, or they don't know their scope. They just throw it on. You don't want to be trying to figure all that stuff out on the fly. Try to figure out as much as you can beforehand. What you said reminded me of something else. One really important thing, or one really helpful thing, is have a headlamp. Have like a little headlamp or admin light that you can use, a little red light that you can use to find your stuff, clip your tripod in, and do all those little things. If you have a helmet, you know, get a nice helmet light, like those Princeton Tech lights or something like that. Yep. Especially if you're on gate duty, for sure. Yeah, yeah. We just got some new lights yesterday. Streamlight Sidewinder stock, and things are sweet. We all run helmets, so yeah, it makes a big difference. You don't want to be holding a flashlight. Anytime you can free up your hands, it's better. It's better. Because you're going to have a tripod. You're going to have your rifle. You're going to yep. need to mess with stuff. It makes a big difference. Hell, there's been times where I forgot where my, how my buttons were laid out on the damn scope. I'll go from a TH-50C over to the Hybrid 75, and I assume in them, like, where the hell's the record button? I'm looking up there. you got to have some type of light. So yep. red light's badass. You don't want a white light in the field. I had some stuff at the bottom that's kind of just like funny noob stuff, little observations that I have about like when you take a new person, they're really excited. They think everything's a hog. Oh boy. Armadillo. Armadillo. Sean was the worst. When we got a thermal in Sean's hand and I was out there with Estian, he was chasing everything. And I'm like, Sean, you're chasing a damn armadillo. 
It's funny. Everything looks like it's big, but it's yeah. You get used to it really quick. Everybody does it when they're starting. Yes. Estian was like that too, boy. He he wouldn't stop. pointed out armadillos and raccoons all night, all night. But you learn, and especially if there's like there's no trees for like a size. You know, if there's an armadillo out there in the middle of the pasture, hundred yards away, every noob's gonna get tricked though. Mm. Obviously, if there's trees in the back, you can definitely tell. Hey, that's a that's a raccoon. That's a armadillo. Things like that by the size of the tree in the background. Everybody makes that mistake. Start now. It's still, I don't care. I'm still making it. When you get skunk for a really long time, and all of a sudden you see this bob moving along the trees, it's, it's like it's big. It's a coyote, you know. Uh, something else. People without suppressors. Woo! I got my own gun. Mm -hmm. I'll bring my own rig. Nope. I was that guy. I was that guy for a really long time. So loud. Yeah, it was brutal. Tyler started getting extra cans, and so he just knew that he had to bring an extra can for me, and that made a huge difference. But please, if you got one suppressor, buy another one because that's going to be the buddy rig right there. You're always going to have somebody that wants to tag along. You need to have a spare suppressor with you. It's just the polite thing to do, and you're going to kill a lot more, especially if you're hunting smaller properties. You will get more opportunities with a suppressor and occasionally especially if you're by yourself you're going to be able to take one shot and wait and possibly get multiple shots if you're shooting just one at a time it doesn't work all the time but it does occasionally it does, yeah, it does. especially if you're on somebody else's property I mean, if you want to get invited back, you don't want it to sound like Fallujah out there at 2.33 yeah. in the morning all night long. You probably won't get that invited yeah, back. You're right. I've hunted right next to landowners' homes and still do all the time. And I feel so bad. Even shooting suppress, I still feel bad about doing it. And I'll text them the next morning and be like, hey, did I wake you up last night? I didn't even know you was there. Yeah. And I'm like, man, that's awesome. So, Some more stuff. Not knowing the terrain. Hmm. Culvert. Yeah. That can apply to ID and animals. Culverts are the thing that probably tricks me the most. Culverts look like hogs for some reason. At distance. In through a thermal. I even get tricked by culverts with my naked eye. There's something about them. Something about yeah. the shape, that round shape. They end up looking like a hog. But yeah, knowing the terrain. So if you're hunting a property, somebody else's property, have them show you around, show you where all the hazards are. If there's a random T post in the middle of a pasture, you need to know about it. If there's a big hole, and it can really be a safety issue. Huge. I know some guys gotten a real bind. Some people died. Know the property that you're hunting, know the terrain, because at night it's going to be completely different. So if you know it, at least in the daytime, you're going to have much better luck. Me and T-Mac last year, we were taking a shortcut through one of the fields of at least. And we was on three wheels in that buggy, man. I mean, that, that buggy was like this. And I'm like, where the hell did that hole come from? It was overgrown. Didn't see yeah. the hole, you know, and I've never crossed that area before. So it does not hurt to go. I do it all the time. Now, every time I go up there during the daytime, I'm either on the dirt bike or on the side by side. And I'm just scouting and trying to learn new areas and check out the terrain. Always do that. Yeah. That's going to be a long night. If yeah. You don't do that. Yeah. It'd be a long Last night. thing you want to do is get stuck out there at two 30 in the morning. And it's happened. In the morning. 100% yeah. it's, happened. It's, it's happened to everybody. Happened to me so many times, but I feel like knock on wood, I don't get stuck very much anymore. Cause I'm so cautious about yeah. stuff like that. Used to be like, I can make it. Don't yeah. worry. I got it. If the farmer or the landowner tells you don't go there, you don't better listen. There. Yeah, you better don't go listen. There. Yeah, you better listen. And that's where night vision comes in, too. I'm a big, big fan of running dual thermals, but there has been many times where I just wish I was running night vision. Night vision helps you see the terrain so much better. So many pros and cons with that, too, though. Yeah, there is. I prefer my dual thermals, but like I said, there's times that I wish I had. I wish I was just running night vision. Walking loudly. When you're stalking in on pigs, people think they're dumb. They can hear pretty well. And especially, you need to listen to how loud you are or you and a group of people are. Like four people on a stalk through a cut cornfield some, is going to sound like a herd of buffalo. Yeah, it's bad. Get appropriate footwear that you can feel the ground when you step and step heel to toe lift your feet lift your feet up yeah don't drag and, and and you get a good feel like you said shoes or boots that you can feel real good there's been plenty of times where i've stepped on us on, on a big branch or something and it's just like oh don't you know don't put your weight on that you know and keep moving because we're, we're all trying to get close i know i know how we hunt and we want to get as close as possible when you start getting really close to these animals you have to pay attention to noise you have to that's another thing that I was thinking about earlier is that if you don't have a lot of experience hunting and you go with somebody who's experienced, 
the best thing that you can do is observe what they do. Like on a stock, I'll tell people, whatever I do, just mirror what I'm doing. If I slow down or if I start walking quieter or if I step off the gravel road onto the grass because it's making less noise, you just do the same. Mm -hmm. And that's hard to go wrong if you do it that way. Because sometimes I'll be stalking in and I have a thermal monocular on my head. I can see what the pigs are doing. Sometimes I'll see a sow stop and look up and look directly in our direction. So I'll stop. If you don't have a thermal on your head, but you can see that I've stopped and you just pause and do whatever I do, mm -hmm. you'll probably be in good shape. The worst thing that you can do is be off on your own. I've taken so many people and we're stalking in on pigs and we're about to get ready to shoot. And we look back and there's a dude 20, 30 50 yards, 50 yards back it's, looking in the opposite direction. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I was just about to say that. Stay close to the people you're stalking with, please. Yeah. You're standing back there, and more than likely, you're going to miss out. And it's super dangerous. Super dangerous. It's super dangerous. You need to stay on the person's ass when you're stalking, please. There's no way to communicate with you. No way. When you're on a stalk and somebody's 50 yards back, we can't yell at you. Yeah. yeah. It's frustrating. I've cussed a few people out. Get your ass over here. It's like, what were you doing back there? I thought I saw a coyote. What That's not important. Yeah, what was he going to do? Okay, what, what, you want all of us turn around and come back to you? Looking at the damn armadillo? If somebody has a, a thermal monocular or a helmet-mounted monocular and all you have is a weapon scope, let them go. Please first, just yeah. let them go and don't stop and yeah. scan and pan with your rifle. Oh, my God. Muzzle flashing. When I take people, it's so scary when people get on those rifles and start panning them around. And two, it slows everything down because it's like, okay, now you're looking at your rifle. So I got to go all the way around you to grab something else out of the truck and avoid stepping in front of your muzzle. Mm -hmm. I know some people are just, I was against it when I first got into the helmet setup, but I'm telling you guys right now, it is a game changer. And I'm not saying you have to run a helmet, a handheld will be just fine, but the whole weapon mounted optic that's not coming off and you're just muzzle flashing, I'm telling you right now, you're missing out on a lot of game and it's crazy dangerous. Get yourself a monocular or some type of head a helmet set up, it's going to change the game. And just hands-free, you're scanning 24-7. It's, it's just the way to go. Yeah. There's been plenty of times, especially coyote calling, and, you know, there's a coyote coming in, you smash them, you're still calling, and I'll be still scanning around with my helmet looking, and there'll be a coyote 15, 20 yards behind us just looking at us. It happens all the time, and I would have never caught that if I was just running around with a weapon mounted. It happened to I'll, us with you when you were shooting on that where that tank was yeah that was yeah same thing and it, we're constantly scanning with our helmets man you're con i'm constantly i'm not locked on that coyote that's coming in at 200 yards i'm not even locked on him i'm still scanning and looking around and I look over and it's always the invite and i'll look over and then somebody's just panning all over the place i'm like you see that coyote no where where is he at one o'clock he's still looking I'm, like, I'm about to shoot him. we know everyone can't afford yeah a, a weapon mounted thermal and a monocular and a helmet mounted thermal. You know, get a weapon scope that has a QD mount. You can use it as a scanner. It'll be much safer to just use it handheld and then just pop it on your rifle when you're ready to shoot. Those things will return to zero, no problem. And uh, if you get familiar with them, index the spot on your rail where you have them and kind of know how to take them on and off. And that's a good tool. And it's lighter. Your rifle will be lighter and you'll have a handheld. You'll be able to scan a lot easier than just swinging your rifle everywhere. I've noticed taking people out in the past, hunting with them, and we'll be, we'll be hunting with all the setups. You know, I have my whole helmet set up and I'm talking not even a month, month and a half later, they got a handheld or a helmet set up. It's like, that's the only way to do it, man. That's the only way. So it's, it's, it's awesome sharing that experience. Let's wrap it up. I think that's a lot of good information. We don't want to go overboard. We're going to try to do these regularly and try to just give people information, try to provide some value with these conversations. Feel free to chime in. If you got any ideas or something that you want to hear about, chime in. Give your opinions in the comments about whether you should hunt with FMJs. <laughs>